You are listening to the Good Advice Softball Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett, and on this show, you'll learn how to help the softball player in your life sharpen her skills, improve her mindset, and find new confidence through softball. Welcome back to the Good Advice Softball Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. In today's episode, we're going to cover three topics. First, we're going to talk about some common shoulder injuries, shoulder ailments, Uh, that softball players often get second we're going to talk about agility ladders do they actually work for developing foot speed and quickness and sprint speed all that stuff and lastly we'll talk a little bit about sports specific training and whether this is something a that actually exists and b if you actually need to seek it out for your daughter's training Okay, so let's talk about some common shoulder injuries and, uh, you know, throwing and pitching and how they all sort of tie together. So there's a couple things to understand about the climate of throwing injuries. Number one, there's a lot of research done on baseball pitchers. So pretty much all of that is sort of extrapolated to softball. We're all humans. Obviously, the ball is different. It's a lot heavier in softball. It's a lot larger. You know, it's uh, 6.7 to 7.2 ounces versus 5 ounces for a baseball. So there's some differences, right? But essentially, there's not that many differences as far as like where we produce stress, you know, the the body parts that are most at risk. But here's the one, the, the two main factors um, for, well, the three main factors for injury. So number one is ball velocity. Ball velocity is highly correlated with the shoulder varus torque, which that is the torque created from the shoulder as it rotates super explosively to throw the ball. So the arm lays back into that sort of like gross looking position, right? And then it explodes forward. So that torque is very, very difficult on your body. It's not really, you know, we say that it's a natural motion. I suppose humans have been throwing objects for a long time, but it's not a healthy motion, whether it's something we've been doing for a long time as humans or not, at least not at really high velocities the way baseball pitchers uh, throw. So the reason I'm mentioning that is the, the harder you throw, the more exposed you are to injury. So softball is a little bit protective in a sense because the ball is heavier and so it cannot be thrown nearly as hard. For me as a, a former baseball guy who could throw into the mid-90s, I could throw a softball a little bit above 80. I think my peak was 84. Uh, It's hard to remember, but I know I could get it above 80. And that made my arm feel absolutely terrible, number one, throwing it that hard. Um, But B, 80 is not really that fast. It's fast enough to, you know, it's it's fast enough to hurt your arm, but not nearly as many pitchers who are not overused hurt their arms throwing 80-ish. So obviously the harder you throw the uh the 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 higher that stress goes up now it's also very individual so what stress uh the stress you know like sally's shoulder and and sally's elbow could handle might be much greater than the stress that tina's uh shoulder can handle so there's not just one level of stress that is uh you know like if you reach this point you know if we were to measure it that if you throw this hard and have this amount of stress on your arm that you're going to blow your arm out. It's different for everyone. Some players can be can go really long, uh, have long careers uh, with more stress than other players who have very short careers because of injury. So it's it's highly specific. But the big thing to know is the harder you throw, the more it's a it's unfortunately a double edged sword. The more obviously performance you get, all right. It's uh, you can make a lot more plays when you throw harder, but you're adding speed, just kind of like a car. If you drive your car faster the wreck is going to have more energy. It's going to be potentially more deadly. So that's one thing to know. Uh, number two, overuse is a huge factor. And I think we all understand that. Um, I know in softball, we sort of leave, uh, have this naive idea that softball pitching, there is like no overuse that you can just throw, you know, 500 pitches in a weekend. Uh, that's not really true. More and more research is being done. That's sort of debunking that. So overuse is a big thing. Obviously, uh, softball games, there's a lot of just overhand throwing. You can play f- six games in a weekend tournament, no sweat. That's a lot of throwing. And so overuse is one of the big ones, especially for girls to play multiple sports. So if you're a basketball player, which basketball doesn't bleed over nearly as much because um, obviously it is, is a winter sport, 
or if you're a volleyball player that's the bigger one where you're hitting a ball another obviously another object um obviously the volleyball is heavier than a softball you're colliding with it with your arm you're not actually throwing it and typically volleyball season has a, a decent overlap with at least training off-season training for softball so that's a, t- a tough one lots of girls that we worked with over the years who played volleyball had consistent shoulder problems because they were constantly doing both they'd go to volleyball practice for two hours then have softball practice a day later and their arms are just exhausted so overuse is a big one and it's not exclusively games like i said it can also be the whole scope of your training so multiple sports included basketball also can be tough not nearly as big of a deal as as volleyball uh just because you know the your arms are up overhead so your shoulders can can be tired if you're shooting 150 baskets um over a long practice you know that's that's not insignificant load on your shoulders so overuse is obviously a big one and and the other big one that contributes to shoulder problems especially in softball players is is shoulder laxity so laxity just means your shoulder joint just isn't that stable it's kind of loose most girls have this uh, because girls have lower testosterone as compared to boys they tend to have less muscular strength and so less muscular strength just tends to mean their joints are just a little bit looser in general and they just have more natural flexibility uh, because of some other hormonal factors as well so with with all of our female athletes that we worked with over the years we were always highly stressing rotator cuff work and lots of upper body training just because we want their shoulders to be strong and stable and that just means when the shoulder um when you know the the upper arm the the uh, the humerus when that's held in the shoulder socket we want those muscles really like clinging to it and holding it on tight right so the uh that's a really important factor so those are three big ones those are by no means the only injury factors um but those are big ones so overuse shoulder laxity uh and then ball speed so actually when you have really poor throwing mechanics and softball at least i don't think that it really exposes you to more injury because the ball speeds are so low uh, it's almost like your body is so inefficient that it just you're not gonna still gonna produce that much stress now and over the years I've seen a lot of players and I haven't seen a tremendous correlation between arm pain and how bad their throwing mechanics are really I see lots of girls with bad throwing mechanics who don't have arm pain and then I see some girls with good throwing mechanics that do have arm pain and I see everything in between so it's not necessarily again because of ball speeds if you had terrible mechanics but you're throwing a ball 90 miles per hour you'd be in trouble for sure but usually bad mechanics hold you back from throwing very hard at all and then again lower ball speeds are protective on the body so it's not like you're gonna you're gonna blow out your elbow ligament throwing 44 miles per hour across the diamond and you're not really gonna probably tear your labrum doing that either unfortunately um well not unfortunately unfortunately but you i hopefully you get what i mean it's uh you know as you throw harder and your mechanics actually improve you actually put more stress through it so it's it's a it's a weird uh, conundrum a little bit so that being said let's talk about some some actual injuries that players get the the thing to know is most softball players will not hurt their ucl like baseball players like i've had tommy john surgery twice which is an elbow ligament reconstruction surgery when you throw hard enough or if you're overused or other factors you can tear that elbow ligament that elbow ligament that provides stability in your elbow um but very few softball players end up getting the injury again because i think probably the number one reason is just ball speeds the the, how hard they throw are just lower if you're really hard throwing softball player you throw 65 and that just is is not very hard so uh so ucl tears in the elbow ligament are generally caused by significant overuse and competitive throwing much more so associated with baseball pitchers than position players position players in baseball are still very infrequently getting tommy john surgery uh, or suffering major ucl injuries or partial tears so it's really more exclusively limited to baseball players and then when you also then you go to softball because again ball speeds are low ucl tears they're not really something that's significantly uh, a, a worry the bigger one is our, our growth plate tendonitis and labrum tears so labrum tears are so you have a little piece of tissue in your shoulder called your labrum it helps sort of deepen your socket 
So it helps kind of keep your, it kind of wraps around the head of the bone in your shoulder socket and just provides a little bit more depth because your shoulder is very shallow. It's kind of like a golf ball on a tee is the common analogy. So if you imagine this piece of tissue wraps around the golf ball to kind of hold it in place a little bit better. So the labrum is protected by good shoulder stability. So the stronger your shoulders are, the more rotator cuff work you do, and the less, again, of that natural laxity that you have, the more your shoulder is held stable in that joint. And so it's the, the bone's not banging around and, and sort of like damaging the labrum because it's sort of like moving and jostling around. Just like if, you know, anything, any, any machine, any mechanical device, when it has loose things rattling around in it, it eventually sort of destroys itself, right? Like if your engine has a, has a rod loose, it's going to eventually destroy the whole engine. So that's pretty much the the way to think about labrum injuries they're highly preventable not always preventable by any means but they're highly preventable and in baseball labrum and shoulder injuries have gone way way down the last five ten years because we know so much more about how to care for and strengthen the shoulder compared to the elbow which is actually sort of like a passive structure so labrum tears are highly preventable with a good rotator cuff and shoulder program that a player is going to do three or four days a week um, probably from when they're like 13 and, and up and it could be younger if they start having shoulder problems a little bit earlier that just might be an indicator that they need a little bit more of it so labrum tears are you know they, they can require surgery most of the time they should not go through surgery because um, and again that's not advice for me that's just saying you know most doctors will agree that labrum labrum surgery outcomes are not great so most doctors try to opt for rehab first and, and exhaust all efforts before undergoing surgery. Um, growth plate is a very common one. We would see one or two players get a growth plate injury every year in my academy. And I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit that because, you know, number one, you can't prevent every injury as a, as a strength coach or a coach in general. Number two, uh, it's really tied to, you know, like it says, growth. So when your growth plates are open, which is until you're, you know, growing, you're done growing there, they can just, they're going to take some of the stress of whatever you do. So some players never have a growth plate problem. They play tons of softball. They play tons of whatever sport they lift, they run, they do all this crazy stuff. They're climbing from trees and they never have any growth plate issues. Other athletes, they throw a little bit and they have growth plate inflammation their elbow hurts. So it's typically in the elbow or the shoulder is where you'd see it. And, uh, it's not basically what all the doctors have always come back with is they say they can do anything that doesn't cause them pain. So if they can do a push up without pain, no problem. If a push up or, a th or a throwing a ball continues to give them pain, then it's going to continue to set them back. So growth plate, um, growth plate injuries, whether it's growth plate inflammation or a growth plate fracture, which you want to avoid. Uh, which can require surgery. They might have to go in and, and put a screw in to, to reattach it. Um, there, you just need to be cautious. So any little bit of um, any little bit of elbow pain or shoulder pain should be looked at, and uh, they should be uh, they should evaluate it with an X-ray to see if it might be growth plate infl inflammation. Because if it is growth growth plate inflammation, then you want to take that four, six, or eight weeks off, which unfortunately is necessary to let the the inflammation go down. Because if you continue to aggravate it, and that's doing things that aggravate it. So again, you could be at a, you know, hit or or lift weights. Lots of kids could li could lift weights perfectly fine. They just couldn't throw, or they couldn't swing a bat. So it just depends. But as long as you don't continue to aggravate, it'll heal. If you continue to aggravate it, it'll eventually probably crack, and then you'll have an issue, and you might need surgery. So uh, growth plate injuries are definitely something to take seriously. Uh, the prognosis is not terrifying when you know if it's just a little bit of inflammation you just give it some rest and don't aggravate it but you can continue to be active if it doesn't bother it um, but that's just something to be aware of last one is, is tendonitis this is kind of a catch-all term um, and it can just be hey you know we've got some again some laxity in the shoulder my shoulder is pretty overworked uh, where I just don't have the strength and my mechanics maybe are contributing to the issue and so my shoulder is just inflamed and angry at me and that kind of falls under the scope of tendonitis. So typically when you when you get tendonitis, you want to address something else, which is, do I need to start to strengthen my shoulder more? Do I need to get on an arm care program? Do I need to look at, you know, other issues with my body? Like what's putting this extra stress on my arm? Am I throwing too much? Is there an overuse issue? So anytime you go in for arm pain, 
be sure to check it out not from the sense of like let's just get a band-aid for it and just rest it but let's also let's also reevaluate what we've been doing because maybe you know a, six games in a weekend just isn't good for you so and that might be the the, the chief cause so hopefully this overview of of, uh, of common throwing injuries is helpful it's good as a parent just to have a, a, a general knowledge of what's going on if your daughter has pain All right, let's talk a little bit about agility ladders. So uh, as a former strength coach, uh, academy owner, well, I'm still a strength coach, not an academy owner anymore. We would get parents a, a good amount. They'd come in and say, hey, my daughter needs to get faster. She really wants to improve her, her home the first time. And you know, like, we really want to, you know, can she do some agility ladders? Like we really want to do some of this and that and make sure she gets faster. So agility ladders have been they've gotten the ire of strength coaches for the last like five, 10 years, uh, because it's kind of, it kind of falls under the term of eyewash. Eyewash is a, unfortunately it used to be a great term, but now, now it's been overused. Um, eyewash is just when you're doing something because it looks good, but doesn't actually do anything. Eyewash just in the, uh, in the, in the baseball slang and softball slang realm also just sort of means when you're going through the motions just to look good in front of your coach or your teammate. So, you know, like you're just goofing off and then coach shows up and then you just immediately jump on the tee and you start swinging. It's like that, that girl's all eyewash. She only works hard when coach is watching. So anyway, the, uh, as far as agility ladders go, the way you develop sprint speed is this, you learn to put more force into the ground, just like a car. If you put a bigger engine in it, it's going to go faster. So you learn to put more force in the ground. You do that through strength training. So strengthening your legs, specifically your quads, hamstrings, glutes, right? And then how fast can you apply that force to the ground? So that's where sort of plyometrics comes in and uh, taking the strength that you built and learning to teach your body to summon it faster through faster um, neuromuscular factors. So that's sort of the cocktail. And then obviously the third part is your running, your sprinting mechanics. So having good sprint form makes you more efficient. So you apply more of your power fast into the ground you know, at the right body angles and without running on your heels, stuff like that, you get your foot in the optimum position to take the next foot strike. Running sprinting mechanics are are important, right? But then again, for all players, everyone's going to have a little bit of a unique gait, the way they run. And some players can run faster than everyone else with subpar sprint mechanics. And some players can have impeccable sprint mechanics and still be slower. So those are, but it's still obviously very important to have sprint, um, sprint technique is part of your training. So as far as agility ladders go, they don't do any of those things. They don't teach you to apply force to the ground faster. So they don't actually strengthen your legs. They don't teach you how to apply force faster to the ground. That's only done through plyometrics really. Um, and plyometrics are typically not jumping up on things, but actually jumping down from things. So when you jump off a box, your body has to decelerate your body fast. And so it learns to fire its muscles faster to decelerate it. That's why you can't jump off a two-story building and be okay because your body can't decelerate the speed of your fall fast enough. You could jump off like an eight-foot thing, right? Or maybe like a 10-foot thing. But if you get above that, your body doesn't have the strength to decelerate your body fast enough. But through plyometrics, jumping down from boxes and then quickly jumping back up, stuff like that, there's lots of different types they teach your your neuromuscular system to actually fire its muscles faster and summon more of your muscle muscle fibers quick more quickly so a a sprinter like usain bolt is both incredibly strong and his body also can summon all that power so it's putting like 500 pounds into the ground in one tenth of a second for example those are just numbers i'm making up but that's whereas someone else if they put 500 pounds of force the same amount of force as him into the ground in two tenths of a second they're slower because Usain Bolt just hit it right off the ground that when one tenth of a second. So that's sort of the formula is how fast can you apply a lot of force into the ground very, very quickly. So agility ladders, again, they don't teach your, your legs to become stronger through strength training. They don't do that. They don't teach your body to apply force more, more quickly. And then lastly, they obviously don't work on um, sprint technique. So foot speed is something that you can, you know, agility ladders, and the coordination 
they're good for warm-ups. They're kind of fun. So if they motivate athletes, that's fine. We would use them in warm-ups sometimes. They're good for young kids who are still learning to like have body control and uh, just learning general athleticism kind of things. We would do with, you know, the youngsters like six to eight. But if you're looking at sprint speed for the off season, you want to get faster, agility ladders, they're just not the way to go. All right, let's lastly talk about sports-specific training. So this was a Twitter conversation uh, from a good friend of mine recently. He was sort of embroiled in this with other people, even with other strength coaches who were saying, eh, sports-specific training is not really a thing. Well, it's it's definitely a thing. So here's what sports-specific training is. So most athletes are going to do about 80% of the same exercises as any other athlete. So if you're a swimmer, you're a volleyball player, you're an Olympic weightlifter, you're a softball player, you're still going to do 80% of the same things because you're a human being, right? We're all humans. And no matter what your sport, you need strength from the anterior part of your side, the front part of your body and the rear of your body. So you're going to need strong butt, strong hamstrings, strong quads. You know, you need a strong core because that connects your lower half and your upper half. You need strong arms, right? So those things are all important. And we want to cover all the basic human movements, which are like pushing something away, pulling something towards you, hinging at the hips and squatting. And so, you know, like bending at the knees, the hip hinge, um, push pull are like the four basic movements. And then there's obviously other sort of variations beyond that that get a little more granular, but in in general, like any athlete on any good program is going to do those things. They're going to do a mix of hip of hinging and squatting movements that includes like lunges and squats hinging movements include like deadlifts and deadlift variations and hamstring curls stuff like that pushing exercises like bench press dumbbell bench press push-ups pulling exercises which are all rowing variations and different angles so a chin-up is an overhead row obviously a seated row is a horizontal row stuff like that every athlete's going to need to do those so there really isn't that much sports specificity in those core ones Um, but then again, you do start to get into it a little bit deeper. So with like a, a softball player, a dumbbell bench press is probably better for their shoulders than a straight bar dead, uh, or bench press. And a push up is probably better than, you know, maybe a dumbbell bench press at first. So those that can be a little bit sport specific. Now, the big thing is the 20%, uh, of things that every athlete's not going to do. So if you compare a softball player's strength program to a swimmer's program, a swimmer doesn't really need to do rotational core exercises. They don't really need to do uh, a lot of, they do need to do some rotator cuff exercises, but not really that many rotator cuff exercises. They don't really need to do that much grip strength either, right? They're swimming. So with a swimmer, and I actually don't really know what the extra stuff would be for a swimmer because it's not my expertise, but um, a swimmer's program isn't going to have some of those things for softball. Whereas for a softball player, the 20% of things is going to be probably some some knee care right so it's a female athlete so we're going to do some uh lateral hip strengthening to help prevent acl tears we're also going to do a lot of grip strength because you hold a bat grip strength is important for both swinging and for throwing Um, we're going to do a lot of rotator cuff work as we mentioned before because that's going to protect throwing arms because throwing arms are a big injury risk Uh, we're also going to do a lot of rotational core work which is throwing medicine balls and also doing anti-rotation exercises for core stability because you swing a bat and you throw and those are both rotational exercises so those are the sport specific things that it wouldn't really make that much sense to program that in again to a swimmer's program or to a soccer player's program like why do we need to put grip strength into a soccer player's program there's not a significant need for that you can certainly put some in there but it's certainly not a priority right we don't really need to put much rotator cuff work into a soccer player's program they're not really using their shoulders in the same overuse scenario that a softball player is. Sure, certainly they're, they need posture and, and rotator cuff is important for every person, but not nearly to the extent of a softball player, right? And then why does a, a soccer player need rotational med ball throws? They don't, right? They'll throw some, uh, some soccer throws in from out of bounds overhead, but there's not really a rotational component in softball, or I'm, I'm sorry, in soccer. So you, you can see like there's definitely a difference between the two programs, the way you do it. 
But again, the soccer player and the softball player are both going to get a lot of glute exercises, core exercises, pushing and pulling and legs and, and all that stuff. Um, and so there's going to be, again, that, that big overlap, but the, the really fine tuning things, those are the things that make a, a program sport specific. So, um, don't be misled if you like sports specificity is not the biggest deal in the world, especially for younger athletes, but it does become a big deal, especially for softball, because they do need arm care. They do need rotational work to help develop their bat speed and their throwing speed. There are some definite needs that a good strength coach is going to put into a softball specific training program. Well, that's all the good advice I've got for today. If you enjoy the show and would like to support me while also helping yourself, enroll today in one of my online softball courses. My She's Got a Cannon throwing courses come with pricing plans for any budget, and my Resolute Athlete Mental Skills course will help your daughter or team build the mindset of a champion. Enroll in any of my courses through the links in the show notes and save 20% with code GOODADVICE just for being a listener. Be sure to subscribe to my weekly email list where you'll get updates on all my new videos and episodes. Nearly 4,000 people get my emails, and you should too. Sign up through the link in the show notes. Lastly, who do you know who can use some good advice? Please share this podcast with a friend, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and subscribe to my Snap Softball YouTube channel where you'll find this podcast and hundreds of softball instructional videos. Back when I was a player, I was always thankful for good coaches and good advice. I'm Dan Blewett, and I'll see you next time.